Do you want to check out IT Pro TV but aren't ready to commit? We're making a few episodes from our most popular courses free for you to try here on YouTube so you can see what they're all about. Enjoy this episode and head over to itpro.tv when you're ready to see the full course. Hello everyone, welcome to the AZ900 series. I'm your host, Cherokee Boos, and here today I'm joined by Mr. Mike Roderick to talk about fault tolerance and disaster recovery and really understanding what those terms mean, how they differ, and yeah. Yeah, they are. They're, they're important concepts that we need to be familiar with as we're preparing for this AZ900 exam. And they're, they're terms that, that people oftentimes confuse, right? And they, they get them mixed up. Fault tolerance, disaster recovery, same thing, not the same thing. And they're not the same thing, right? They do have different meanings. And we have to understand what those meanings are as we move forward uh, through this, this course, as well as when we get out there and start implementing things uh, in the real world using Azure. Yeah, I mean, after a pretty big or catastrophic event has happened or already occurred, that's not when you have this discussion, right? So. <laughs> exactly right. So you need to know, you know what these terms mean, why they're important to us. And then later on, as we move through this course, we'll talk about actual implementations and how Azure provides fault tolerance and how we can use it to get that level of fault tolerance we need, as well as that level of disaster recovery. But for now, let's just focus in on those terms, what they mean and what their differences are. So let's start, Cherokee, with something known as fault tolerance. And if you slow down and think about those words, it almost explains itself to you, right? And let's, let's reverse them. Let's say I want to be tolerant of fault, right? I want to be able to continue on even if something goes wrong. That's the, really the whole idea behind fault tolerance. I always, I don't know why in my brain, I think about limping along like, oh man, I don't know. I'm not going to make it to, you know, but I'm, I'm chugging along. I'm, I'm not going as fast as I was before. It might really hurt, but I'm going to make it. Right? So you it's have like, like your, so my brain goes like this and it's kind of the same thing, but you have your, I'm assuming like your two legs, right? And yep. one is hurt. So you have two, so you can still somewhat hobble along there, but right, you're still able to. You and can you know, sprain an ankle or something, you can keep on going, right? Exactly. And so for, you know, working, starting in hardware and everything, I'm always thinking about, we see this a lot with servers. Like we have multiple power supplies. We have, you know, multiples of everything just so that we don't get in that situation. Multiple network interface cards so that one of those doesn't fail and leave us high and dry, basically. And that right there, that's the exact concept we need to understand. It's just really, it's all about having multiples or having more than one, usually, of a particular resource gives Gives us that fault tolerance, whether it's at the power supply level, right? Most of our servers, if you think old school on-premises, uh, most of our servers have dual power supplies. Or your workstation at home, you might have put dual power supplies in there, right? Or dual network adapters, as you said, if one fails, I can double them up and I can take advantage of, of, of duplex, full duplexing, right? And get a lot of fast speed. But if one of them fails, I can still make it. I'm still connected. I can still, you know, do whatever it is I need to do. I'm not completely high and dry. And that's the idea behind fault tolerance. When you look at RAID systems, right? Why do we use RAID and hard drives? Because of the fault tolerance capabilities, right? If I have five drives and I've got a RAID array set up, I could lose one of those drives and I can still access that data. Might not be as fast as I could when all the drives were functioning normally, but I can still access it. And that's the idea behind fault tolerance. Being able to survive a partial failure. That's another key I want you to remember with fault tolerance. When you're defining fault tolerance in your brain, think re surviving a partial failure of one or more components. Okay, and I see here, and I'm gonna play like devil's advocate here because on your notes here, I see where you, it says, um, not to confuse fault tolerance with something. And so if we're talking about multiples and I implement something like um, auto scaling so that if my website starts, I have a sale and everyone wants to rush to my site and I have more traffic and my web server can't handle that. But then I had implemented auto scaling. So now like three different VMs spin up or however many it would take to handle that incoming traffic, that ingress traffic. But that's not quite the same, although there are multiples of the same thing, right? This is, this is where it gets really confusing and where it's easy for somebody that's just getting into this to, to make that assumption that scaling is fault tolerance, right? But it's not. This is where we have to be careful because the thing like scaling and auto scaling, and I know we haven't really gotten to those concepts in this course yet, but think about as Cherokee explained it very well, you know, you've got a web server hosting a website and when you're traffic peaks, I could spin up a second or a third or a fourth server to handle that extra demand for my website, right? Because one server wasn't going to be enough. So that's what auto scaling will do for me. And it sounds a lot like fault tolerance, but where's the partial failure? 
Yes. Right? See, nothing broke. Scaling assumes that everything is working properly. S machine one or machine A can't handle the workloads. So we spin up a second one, machine B, maybe a third one, machine C. But that's assuming machine A is still working. Because if machine A goes down and I spin up B, did I increase the ability to handle a workload? Not at all, right? Um, and that's the difference between scaling and fault tolerance, whereas scaling is just adding resources to an existing solution that is currently functioning properly, whereas fault tolerance is all about trying to limp along the, and handle that partial failure uh, until we can get things back up and running. And Azure has different ways of dealing with fault tolerance. As I said, we'll get into specifics uh, in future episodes, but things like fault domains, where when you spin up VMs and you, you have more than one, Azure might spread those out across multiple, let's say, racks in that data center, right? So if one rack fails, well, the other VM is still is on a completely different rack that didn't fail. Now you've only got one VM, but at least you're still running, right? I mean, of course, you guys probably know it. We know it. We've, we've all had those situations where, think about this, updates, right? So we go to install updates on our system, and something doesn't work exactly the way we had hoped after an update. And you know what? Even Microsoft knows this, and they <laughs> even have, like Mike's talking about different types of fault domains. They even have a, a fault domain type called an update domain. So they don't even update all their servers at the same time because they are aware that that could be a potential risk. So let's update them you know, in waves, if you will. So yeah, that's just another example of you know how it's baked into the Azure platform. Exactly, I love the way you put that, it's baked in, because as we learn about fault tolerance and later on we talk about the specifics, what we'll see is that Microsoft implements a lot of fault tolerance underneath the hood, where we're not even maybe aware or fully cognizant of what's going on. Right? Like I said, when we spin up a, uh, a scale set, while scale sets are not fault tolerance, they might be spreading those machines out across fault domains, so that if one does fail, the others are still there. So what you'll see is that the Azure infrastructure, way down at the bottom, has a lot of fault tolerance built into it, network adapters, power supplies, cooling, things like that. So we're getting that without really having to implement anything. Now, as we examine our applications and their importance and how much downtime we can tolerate, we might decide to implement additional methods that increase our fault tolerance, increase our ability to survive partial failures, right? But don't think that you don't have any fault tolerance if you don't do anything, because there is a lot of fault tolerance built in to Azure without, without doing anything, right? Without which is yep. using the service, right? All right, so if that's fault tolerance, what is disaster recovery, and how does that differ from fault tolerance? I thought and you were going to tell us. I, I think I will. <laughs> well, maybe I'll just wait. No. Yeah, I mean, the, the, again, if we think about the words right, that, that we're saying, I know a lot of times words may have meaning. How about that? Uh, disaster recovery. What do, you, what do you think of Cherokee when you think disaster? Do you think, you know, oh, a power supply failed? Um, I don't know why, but the first thing that came to my mind was something in the kitchen, like you dropped a dish, the glasses broke everywhere, uh, you know, maybe some glass could stab you and you've got the milk and the cereal all on the floor. Is that a pretty, that's a disaster in my book. That does sound like quite a disaster. <laughs> I'm, I'm picturing an old Saturday Night Live Julia Child skit with, with the spurting everywhere, but if you haven't seen that, it, it's definitely worth a look. Do a little web search there. Uh, but yeah, that's a good example of a disaster, right? Fault tolerance is the ability to survive survive a partial failure, a disaster recovery. Now we're talking about complete failure or catastrophic failure, all right? Now, so a disaster, the word disaster just really says it all, right? It's <laughs> not just a power supply failing. It's not just that you dropped the dish. It's the fact that you dropped the dish and the glass flew up and cut you in the arm and now you're spewing blood everywhere, you know, and things like that. That's a disaster. Power supply fails, that's not so bad. But if there's a hurricane and it wipes out all the power lines leading into the data center, now we've got a disaster because everything in the data center is, is blacked out, right? Uh, that's a disaster. And how do we recover from that? That's all about disaster recovery. And a lot of times you'll hear the term uh, business continuity disaster recovery plans, uh, BCDRs. These are plans people put into place for disasters because, as Cherokee, I think, mentioned way back at the beginning of the show, after or during the disaster is not the time to think about how you're going to handle it because now people are making really bad decisions or under a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, things are falling down around them, you know, who knows what's going on. Um, so we, we plan this out with our disaster recovery uh, and our business continuity. The idea is I need to try to continue business somehow, 
All right. Now, again, we're not going to go into specifics just yet about how Azure gives us this, but we look at things like availability sets or being able to replicate across um, different regions, right? What we call that uh, geo replication? Uh, yep, geo redundancy. Yeah, geo or redundancy. It is being replicated across multiple geographies. So, yeah, so that if there is a, a hurricane that hits that data center on the East Coast, well, most likely it's not affecting the data center on the West Coast here in the US. It's not that big, right? Uh, if there's a fire or tornado or an earthquake, natural disasters, usually those are confined to a certain region. And, and I had there's Microsoft has data centers around the world. So not all of those data centers are going to be affected. So if I can somehow spread my data across multiple data centers, for example, I can have that disaster recovery. Now the whole data center could be unavailable. I can still access my data because I've got it replicated to a data center on the other side of the world, right? So that's what disaster recovery is. And their definition, recover operations in the event of a disaster, natural or man-made. Don't assume that disaster is always going to be a hurricane or a fire or a tornado. Uh, this could be, you know, we live in a crazy world. Uh, could be, uh, I don't know, explosives, bombs, you know. Uh, you were dark. Uh, I was thinking, um, do you remember that time where, like, gosh, like the whole East Coast was down for a while because someone had cut um, some a lot. Uh, fiber cable in, I think it was like in, in Houston area. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, just knocked out. It did. All kinds of, like the ability for the power plants to communicate with each other or something. I don't remember, but this was a couple years ago and we were like, so we just, none of us have internet? And yeah. Yeah. It's so crazy. That's... So somebody digs through a, a cable, um, they do it intentionally, you know, they go out and try to sabotage the AC units outside that data center, uh, which those data centers, you're not going to get close to those AC units now. AC units nowadays, but um, you know that's the kind of thing. So just uh, what I really want to make sure is we're not assuming natural. It can also be uh, man-made, um, but typically we're talking about secondary locations. Uh, and then the process is okay. Data center went down. My data is being geo-replicated to another region, so I can still function. And really, unlike fault tolerance, the switchover might incur some downtime. Right as I move, because everybody that was connecting to servers in this data center now have to be redirected. We have to update DNS, or however we're going to accomplish that. There's lots of different methods. Um, I need to redirect people. Once they get redirected, it should be almost the same, assuming that we've got all the same resources available uh, in that other region. So it's not like we're limping along, um, but we do want to move things back. Right. The reason I use the data center here in the East U.S. is because it's closer to the majority of my customers. I'm okay with moving all of that to Europe during the disaster. But when the disaster is over and the data center has been put back together, I want to start moving things back, right? So I do want to go through a process to where I slowly transition back um, and resume normal business. And that's what the business continuity part of that disaster recovery uh, is all about. But so that, that I hope that Cherokee kind of explains the difference there between fault tolerance, which is surviving a partial failure versus disaster recovery, where we're talking about uh, a, a disaster has occurred and nothing is available in a particular area uh, and we want to be able to continue our business. Great, I think that's going to be able to just give everyone a good solid uh, idea of what that means so that when we are you know, later on having our discussions and just talking about how Azure really does take care to implement this in a number of ways and also to provide you a number of options um, in terms of like how prepared do you want to be? That's you know, right. how much money do how you much have? How much money do you have? Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you for setting that groundwork for us, and thank you for joining us as well. But for now, let's sign out. I've been your host, Cherokee Boost, and I'm Mike Roderick. See you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.